Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I'm Clara Davison. Uh, I am an engagement officer in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I will serve as your moderator today. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us for Book Club. Today we will discuss Citizen and American Lyric by Claudia Rankine, selected by Department of English Leaders and Faculty. A big, big thank you to Kathy Fagan Grantinetti, Professor and Director of Creative Writing in the Department of English, and Marcus Jackson, Assistant Professor in the Department of English, for sharing their expertise with us today. Uh, so Kathy and Marcus will get us started with some opening remarks about Citizen and American Lyric. Uh, and then we'll open up the conversation to your questions and comments. And Kathy will get us started. I'm just going to begin um, with a brief introduction for those of you who um, haven't read Citizen for a while or haven't read it at all um, or don't know anything about Claudia Rankine. I'll just do a brief, um, read you a brief introduction now. Um, born in Kingston, Jamaica, Claudia Rankine emigrated with her parents to the Bronx when she was seven and attended Catholic schools there. Yay, Bronx Catholic schoolgirls. The opening moments of Citizen refer to that time in an early recognition of difference, of who's visible and who's invisible, and how those differences are inscribed. Rankine attended Williams College, where she studied with Pulitzer winner Louise Glick, and graduated from Columbia with her MFA in 1993. The following year, she published her first book of poems. After several others, her Don't Let Me Be Lonely, an American Lyric, was published in 2004, which, like Citizen, an American Lyric, incorporates visual arts and graphics, lined verse, blank space, and hybrid verse prose paragraphs. Also a playwright and essayist, Rankine is married to filmmaker John Lucas, and together they make video essays titled Situations, Several of these appear in section six of Citizen. In 2016, Rankine was awarded a Genius MacArthur Grant with which she established the Racial Imaginary Institute, a collaborative project examining race and whiteness. Poet Mark Doty has said of Claudia Rankine's work that it's an investigation of boundaries, verse and prose, the written and pictorial, subject and object. To my mind, the boundaries Doty speaks of don't enforce binar binaries so much as create opportunities to merge, blur, complicate, excavate, and intimately explore both the history and ongoing effects of those boundaries. Rankine has won numerous important awards such as recognitions from the Guggenheim and AAACP, NAACP, and she is now a professor at Yale. Her newest book is Just Us, an American Conversation. Citizen, an American Lyric was published just as the Black Lives Matter movement was catalyzed by the murders of Eric Garner and Michael Brown. In Citizen, Rankine gathers what she's called the thousand cuts of racism from her own life and from the lives of her friends and colleagues. Influenced as a young poet by the political activism in the work of feminist lesbian poet Adrian Rich, Rankine said in a 2020 PBS interview that Citizen is a book in conversation with the work of Toni Morrison, Frederick Douglass, and James Baldwin. Asked in that same interview, what poets can do in the face of racist violence and subsequent protests, she replied, they are able to say what is. Their work becomes a kind of record, but not the record of values, the record of experience. And I'll hand it over to Marcus for some opening remarks now. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I guess I'll just start with a broad, my broad take on the book being good, <laughs> one of the book's biggest risks, and then I'll zoom into some of the text, uh, which I organized in a PDF that I'll do in the screen share. Um, Citizen is a book whose sequencing and cumulative experience are so well orchestrated 
that the reader comes away from the project with the sense that on the page, an entire central nervous system and a new topography of emotional landscape have been fashioned. Rankin does this all within the general topics of racial trauma and racial PTSD, subjects of immense complexity and scale, though citizen brims with fine-grained generative detail, and it radiates with psychological intimacy. Uh, adding to the intricacy and possible riskiness of the book, Rankin chooses to include visual art, revised historic photography, frame reels from a soccer game and script scenarios, uh, as Kathy mentioned. These mechanical, visual, and spatial inclusions would be very difficult for most writers to incorporate into a large topic book length collection while still maintaining coherence and potency. Uh, on the contrary, Rankin excels at installing these extra elements, textures, and realms choosing images, quotes, and modes of voice that either firmly establish crucial, crucial concepts, uh, sensations, and emotions, or echo and enhance those that Rankin has already created. Additionally, the book's multimedia approach mirrors the modern worlds and modern history's contact with human consciousness, perception, and feeling. Uh, since Citizen has a lot of instruments and a lot of notes to play, uh, Rankin shrewdly arranges the opening and the closing of the book in a familiar narrative way, and she reliably employs blank space with sections. Uh, these arrangement decisions subtle, uh, supply the reader with plenty of alignment, breath, and pauses, uh, effectively pacing the overall journey through the book. Uh, one of the most remarkable achievements of this collection is Rankin's ability to fuse vocal methods and spatial presentations. Vocally, uh, Citizen ranges from paragraph form, pinpoint journaling to high intensity free verse lyric, which is quite a span. Uh, the wonderful thing about this span is that it exists within the efficiently entered psychological and emotional interior of the project and their ample intermissions. Uh, all in All Citizen is a crucial book that transcends in inventive ways, uh, that relies at the right times on a few established organizational moves, and that resounds with a balance of precision and abundance. Um, all that said, I guess the, the foremost uh, criticism that I've heard in conversations with other Black poets and other Black readers is that the book is written not directly toward or to Black people. Now, that's sort of the core choice that had to get made at the beginning and throughout the writing of this book and other projects. Another book that strikes me as making the same choice is James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. So I guess the, the other route to go would be to try to write a musically image-based testimony about racial trauma and PTSD, and to do so in traditions of poetic form and poetic style that have existed within the Black arts movement and um, since then. But in the case of Baldwin and Rankin, they want to turn the gaze more toward whiteness and the larger systems of oppression and the larger realistic language and daily interactions when it comes to racism. Uh, and I'll try to pull up the screen share. So one of the main approaches that Rankin takes is tonally when it comes to trying to write in a conversational way at pretty consistent intervals throughout the book. Uh, for me, this is successful in terms of engaging the larger audience or I guess giving white readers a quicker access point to generational black consciousness when it comes to racism and oppression, right? 
Making things conversational, especially when it comes to the topic of racial microaggressions, which the book circles back through when it comes to many anecdotes and portrayals of racial microaggressions um, in current day America. Doing that allows non-Black readers the ability to kind of see whiteness play out on a kind of neutral stage. We don't have a first person lyric voice jumping in as the book starts to, I guess, testify about specific confessional experiences to a consistent eye. Rankin is going for a collage of experiences and the second person conversational tone is really the way to do it. And I'll just read a couple quick uh, examples on pages 12 and 13. Because of your elite status from a year's worth of travel, you have already settled into your window seat on United Airlines when the girl and her mother arrive at your row. The girl looking over at you tells her mother, these are our seats, but this is not what I expected. The mother's response is barely audible. I see, she says, I'll sit in the middle. Next page, a woman you do not know wants to join you for lunch. You are visiting her campus. In the cafe, you both order the Caesar salad. This overlap is not the beginning of anything because she immediately points out that she, her father, her grandfather, and you all attended the same college. She wanted her son to go there as well, but because of affirmative action or minority something, she is not sure what they are calling it these days. And weren't they supposed to get rid of it? Her son wasn't accepted. You are not sure if you are meant to apologize for this failure of your alma mater's legacy program. Instead, you ask where he ended up. The prestigious school she mentions does not seem to assuage her irritation. This exchange, in effect, ends your lunch. The salads arrive. Real quick, just from a poetic standpoint, I love the, the ending detail of the salads arrive <laughs> in terms of the continuation of um, the traumatizing, strange, awkward uh, interactions that happen in society. But we notice even in the same tone, the escalation from page 12 to page 13 and how, um, how complex and intense the racial microaggressions become. And I think that that pace is much more well-suited to a larger audience than uh, beginning the book with that first person lyric testifying or confessional voice that we have seen in other books and in other projects. Um, and thinking too real quick about point of view, um, which is kind of the crux of the main criticism that I've heard from other Black poets and other Black readers, is that why not center it around the eye? Um, and it's, it's, it has to be a conscious choice by Rankin to explore this quandary because it happens right smack dab in the middle of the book, um, page 71 to 73. Uh, I'll just read this aloud. Sometimes I is supposed to hold what is not there until it is. Then what is comes apart the closer you are to it. So already now we have a more poetic or traditionally lyric mode um, centering around that eye, but it gets complicated very quickly. Uh, this makes the first person a symbol for something. The pronoun barely holding the person together. Someone claimed we should use our skin as wallpaper knowing we couldn't win. So we've definitely got some traditional poetic rhythms there when it comes to sound, but we're starting to see that for Rankin in this book, 
the I just was not able to hold together. And that's why she embraces the second person conversational or sort of prose-like approach throughout many of the sections. You said I has so much power, it's insane. And you would look past me all gloved up in a big coat with fancy fur around the collar and record a self saying, you should be scared. The first person can't pull you together. Shit, you are reading minds, but did you try? Tried rhyme, tried truth, tried epistolary untruth, tried and tried. So this is essentially Rankin confessing aesthetically that the traditional proved approaches to this subject matter just were not working for the book and something, some new ground needs to be broken, right? You really did. Everyone understood you to be suffering and still everyone thought you thought you were the sun. Never mind our unlikeness. You too have heard the noise in your voice. Anyway, sit down, sit here alongside. Exactly why we survive and can look back with furrowed brow is beyond me. It is not something to know. You're ill-spirited, cooked, hell on Main Street, nobody's here, broken down, first person, could be one of many definitions of being to pass on. So here we have a lot of the contentiousness between like white elite uh, status and the assumed blues-like black lyric eye right there in that little passage. Uh, the past is a life sentence, a blunt instrument aimed at tomorrow. Drag the first person out of the social death of history, then we're kin. Kin calling out the past like a foreigner with a newly minted fuck you. Maybe you don't agree. Maybe you don't think so. Maybe you were right. You don't really have anything to confess. Why are you standing? Listen, you, I was creating a life study of a monumental first person, a Brahmin first person. If you need to feel that way, still you are in here and here is nowhere. Join me down here and nowhere. Don't lean against the wallpaper, sit down and pull together. Yours is a strange dream, a strange reverie. No, it's a strange beach. Each body is a strange beach. And if you let in the excess emotion, you will recall the Atlantic Ocean breaking on our heads. So this passage is really crucial to the book for me, because as I said, it's, it's Rankin sort of publicly uh, working through all of the different conflicts when it comes to her choosing of how to voice really, really important sections and elements of this book. Um, and it's so interesting to me how fluid both the second person and the I, and then the, the first person singular by the end of this passage become, and the way that whiteness, privilege and being oppressed all are kind of circling through all these pronouns and for me it just especially coming at the at the middle the very center of the book physically um i thought it just opened up more possibilities when it comes to including more visual art and more vocal experimentation for the rest of the project. And then Kathy, did you wanna jump in, add anything? Yeah, I'm just so happy that um, we really didn't rehearse this part. And I'm just so happy that, that Marcus sort of um, got to this central part of the book. I was thinking that, I, I was thinking of the book in terms of sections and what she's doing in each section. Um, you know, the, the, the seven sections plus a kind of postscript that so like, um, amazingly and heart-stoppingly sort of brings so many um, points of the book together, at least for me. 
Um, and I was really interested to hear what you have to say about um, the criticism from Black readers and Black poets. Um, I'm um, looking at that section five that you just read from, and I was thinking as I was reading it through the second or third time, how highly lyric, maybe that's the most lyric portion of the entire book, not just the sections you read from, but that entire section. Um, it may be the most conventionally, conventionally poetic, interestingly. Um, it uses wordplay, uses really dense imagery. The color blue is, is a color that sort of recurs throughout. Um, and I'm also really interested not only in the fact that she uses the first person I hear and questions that, but how this section sort of speaks to the issue of, of kin or making connections to um, Black readers and um, uh, Black, the Black public in the book. Like at the very beginning of the book on page 17, I'm gonna read a, um, a, a brief passage. Um, this is from section one um, uh, about something that takes place on the subway. And of course it takes place in the third person, in the, uh, the second person. A man knocked over her son in the subway. You feel your own body wince. He's okay, but the son of a bitch kept walking. She says she grabbed the stranger's ar arm and told him to apologize. I told him to look at the boy and apologize. Yes, and you want it to stop. You want the child pushed to the ground to be seen, to be helped to his feet to be brushed off by the person that did not see him, has never seen him, has perhaps never seen anyone who is not a reflection of himself. The beautiful thing is that a group of men began to stand behind me like a fleet of bodyguards, she says, like newly found uncles and brothers. Um, and so there she's using, of course, the second person rather than the first, but speaking. Um, to a black audience about, you know, family and um, the protection that family can afford. There's a, a, a longer passage that I won't read you, um, read all of, starting on page 131, um, section six, I think. Um, and it's also a moment that happens in um, second person. And um, I'll just read the beginning so you get some sense of what's going on. Also about seats, um, also about sort of sitting near, sort of um, being a witness, right, to events. On the train, the woman standing makes you understand there are no seats available. And in fact, there is one. Is the woman getting off at the next stop? No, she would rather stand all the way to Union Station. And as this long passage goes forward, um, Rankine writes, you sit next to the man on the train, bus, in the plane, waiting room, anywhere he could be forsaken. You put your body there in proximity to, adjacent to, alongside, within, you don't speak unless you are spoken to and your body speaks to the space you fill and you keep trying to fill it, except the space belongs to the body of the man next to you, not to you. Um, and then a little further down, starting on page, at the bottom of page 132, from across the aisle, from across the aisle, tracks, room, harbor, world, a woman asks a man in the rows ahead if he would mind switching seats she wishes to sit with her daughter or son. You hear, but you don't hear. You can't see. It's then the man next to you turns to you. And as if from inside your own head, you agree that if anyone asks you to move, you'll tell them we are traveling as, family, as a family. Um, so again, so sort of very much I think connected to that amazing, highly lyric, central section in which um, Rankine deploys the first person I. She's, um, she's sort of glancing off, I think that early moment um, on the subway and also that much later moment um, on, the, um, on the train. 
Um, and I'm really, really interested in um, how she manages to sort of, especially given what you've said, Marcus, about white readers and black readers, I'm really interested to see how she manages to sort of navigate um, all of those spaces um, and to um, ultimately address, um, to my mind, um, both, both audiences. I mean, people, at Marcus too, um, sort of introduced um, Citizen by talking about it as a, um, a multimedia presentation, uh, a collage. It's been um, discussed as a, as a book of poems, as a memoir, as a series of essay fragments, a symphonic work, a list. Um, you know, those are forms. We can talk about um, the shapes of the work, but the subject, as Marcus mentioned, um, is uh, incremental racist aggressions, both microaggressions and, um, and the murders of Black people, which she spends a, a great deal of time talking about in the course of the book, and what the cumulative experience of that is. So I don't think that this is a... Um, you know, episodic and fragmentary, to my mind, as I read the book, there is a progression here, but it's not a linear one, right? Um, it's it's a, a progression of cumulative experience from erasure to some extent at the beginning in the first section or two, she talks a lot about um, invisibility, being rendered invisible, um, blacks not being seen. She talks about, um, the erasure of Black people. And then later she talks about, I believe it's on page 49, she goes to the Judith Butler lecture. Um, let me just read, read that portion. So from invisibility and erasure to this, um, not long ago you're in a room where someone asked the philosopher Judith Butler, what makes language hurtful? You can feel everyone lean in. Our very being exposes us to the address of another, she answers. We suffer from the condition of being addressable. Our emotional openness, she adds, is carried by our addressability. Language navigates this. For so long, you thought the ambition of racist language was to denigrate and erase you as a person. After considering Butler's remarks, you begin to understand yourself as rendered hyper visible in the face of such language acts. Language that feels hurtful is intended to exploit all the ways that you are present, your alertness, your openness, and your desire to engage actually demand your presence. You're looking up, you're talking back, and as insane as it is, saying please. Um, and I'm, I'm really um, so taken by that moment given the um, this section that's all about Serena Williams, right? Where Serena Williams as a tennis player, as a black woman, as a body on the tennis court, an unexpected black body, a female black body on the, on the tennis court um, becomes that presence, right? Becomes the hinge actually between the invisible and the visible, um, the erased and the hyper present. Um, I just think it's, um, it, again, once again, the organization of this book just seems to me to be um, wildly successful um, in in those ways. Um, do you want to take over, Marcus? Yeah, I agree. Um, I love those passages. Uh, the the second to last one you read when you were focusing on black folks in public, kind of becoming kin or feeling a kinship. The page right after that is the disappearing list of recently slain black people. And then the, the quote, which is, has been all over the place uh, because white men cannot police their imagination. Um, black people are being murdered. And so even within that three page span, you've got the, the ultra aware and careful um, prose-like conversational second person voice. And then within a page, since in different sections, 
through different visual modes and um, presentations, all of that space can be spanned. And I think that's what the, I think that's what the larger onus of the project is. And that's a really difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. And you can't necessarily, um, you can't necessarily <laughs> sing the best songs for everyone in the audience. But I do think this book does a great deal to include as many voices and singers in the space. Um, and I'll, I'll try to go now to the, to the visual side of it and just kind of think about her choices when it comes to placing the pieces of visual art by the text and what are some of the linkages or the braids and um, the progressions. Uh, speaking about like absence and not being seen as a black person, the moments right before this, this is right at the beginning of the book. I think there are like two pages or two small sections right before this. Yeah, Sister Evelyn, where the speaker uh, was detailing in second person, not being seen by both a white peer student and the nun teaching the class. And then right after that, we have this photo, which is the first inclusion of visual art in the book uh, down here, which is just titled, I think, Jim Crow, but it's from 2008. <laughs> so you have a highly visible right in the center of the image symbol of racial oppression and violence in what looks to be this bland suburban setting could be probably is somewhere very recognizable in America. So by doing that, right after detailing the absence, I think, I think she's setting us up in terms of hesitancy, paranoia, fear, pain, that the images are going to impose on us or be difficult to look at, which isn't the case over the whole book. I think there are moments of beauty and affirmation, um, but there are, all, there are also moments of visual imposition um, in terms of her structuring. Um, this next piece right here, which I think is called Caribou. No, it's called Little, it's called Little Girl. Um, it's also from 2008 by an artist uh, named Kate Clark. So this comes after the moment when the speaker is detailing again in second person, um, the visiting of a new therapist and the therapist assumes that the new patient being in the yard is a trespassing crime intending black person and shouts at the U. And then we get this little section right here it's as if a wounded Doberman pincher or a German shepherd has gained the power of speech. And it's perfectly braided with this image right here called Little Girl. Um, the vulnerability and <laughs> the ability for possible um, metamorphosis, metamorphosis, which might be really, really frightening is, for me, one of the great early moves of the book. Um, also too, it's like the direct gaze, looking straight at the reader, playing uh, against that thought of absence or invisibility that has already been present. Then here, this is after um, one of the Serena Williams um, anecdotes. We have this piece, which is called Sound Suits. And it's right after Serena had instructed an umpire. Um, I'll just read the quote because it's right down here at the bottom of 32. Aren't you the one that screwed me over last time here? Yeah, you are. Don't look at me. Really, don't even look at me. And then this, sorry, this is kind of a, <laughs> a shaky scan. But we have this figure that is evading the gaze or calling 
calling out the injustice, the unfairness of when blackness, when black people are looked at and not looked at. Um, and also too, what I was taken with, with this piece was how colorful and multi-textured it looks on the page. Um, and I started to feel, I remember the first time reading this, I started to feel like the inclusion of, and the pacing of the visual art throughout the book was going to surprise and, and sort of reaffirm um, as we move along in different ways. Um, and then here is a really interesting one. So we have a white tennis player making fun of the Williams sisters' bodies in public on camera, which is extremely hurtful as a reader. Um, and then we go down here to <laughs> the Rutgers women's basketball team who had been called nappy headed hoes by a white uh, shock jock broadcaster. I think his name was like Don Imus or something. But I love how, and this is only a couple pages apart, how this basketball team appears to, if you flip back, be staring directly at that picture and the person who is perpetrating the racism is staring directly back at them. And getting opposition and conversation between the visual pieces themselves was another step or another progression in the book for me. Um, and it continued. Uh, this moment, which is a collage, I believe made from pieces of encyclopedia. Um, this comes, let's see. Yeah, this comes right after that section that I read about trying to figure out point of view and sort of collaging. Um, Kathy hit on it with that great quote, like the thousand, the thousand cuts of racism and oppression. Um, we had seen that in the, the sort of tearing down the regeneration of the first person plural and then thinking about the second person. And right after we get that right at the center of the book, we have this collage um, sort of rebuilding worlds and identity here. And then this is in the section that uses CNN quotes from survivors of Hurricane Katrina. And it follows those quotes up with this stunning piece here that for me is perfectly balanced just in terms of feel when I first look at it between um, the blacks and the blues and then the highlights of the golds. And then when you think about survivorship, resilience, and also on the flip side, being oppressed and beat down by a nation and a government, this piece fits perfectly. And I mean, just to be real, Rankin's not playing around. <laughs> with, with these choices of pieces, then here we get the erasure of the lynching victim so that we can turn our eyes toward whiteness and toward uh, toward the committers of the murders, right? And we can really, really stare into the eyes of white supremacy and white violence against black bodies. And then this happens for a whole section. I think this is really interesting because the text sort of, this is the World Cup section where the text interplays with the frame, frame by frames of an incident that happened in a World Cup game when a player on the French team of uh, Muslim descent from whose, whose people are from Algeria, according to lip readers and people on his team had been being taunted racially throughout the game. And this was in the World Cup finals. I think it was a tie and like overtime. And all the taunting came to a point where the Algerian player turned around and headbutted and ended up getting kicked out of the game and it cost, it cost the team a championship. So what Rankin does here, instead of letting the, the film frames or the video frames 
have the main stage, she includes this wonderful cast of thinkers, philosophers, literary figures, abolitionists on the right side, the right page throughout this whole little section. And I'll just scroll through, right? You see Fanon Baldwin, uh, Zidane is the name of the soccer player, Fanon again, Shakespeare, Fanon again, Baldwin, Baba. So we have this larger conversation and this larger table for all of these people to sit at and infuse their linguistic and bodily experiences when it comes to racism and class and cultural identity. Um, it's just a marvelous, a marvelous braiding of the visual and the historical literary quotes. Um, and too, just the reality of the lip readers. I love her choice to include splices at really important parts that the lip readers were able to make out of what was happening in the game, because it goes back to that, that onus of the project to, of wanting to include reality or, or the, uh, the job of the poet to document along with making music. And for me, this section uh, was one of the heights of that. Um, and then here, when we get to a point in the book where physical and psychological fracturing is at the forefront, we have another collage that is much more um, graphically fractured and has a lot more, uh, I wanna say levels when it comes to, to space and height and feel, if you're able to see a good copy of this image, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, just all the, all the, the violence and the, in this, in this passage textually right before it, um, there are moments of doubting of ownership of one's body, which also came up in the quote that Kathy shared. And this voices that and physically presents it in a way, this choice of image, um, in a way that text couldn't quite do. So again, just hats off to, to those inclusions um, by Rankin. Did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I just that? wanted to sort of just maybe briefly um, say something about um, that section. Well, both of those sections, you were talking about the, um, the World Cup section, that's section six. And that section begins with Katrina um, and um, sort of spirals to the Trayvon Martin, James Craig Anderson, the, the Jenna Six, the stop and frisk, and then moves to England um, with Mark Duggan, right, in the conversation with obviously the white friend in England. Um, then the the World Cup, and I just it it just feels as if the book kind of explodes sort of outward globally, and it's no longer just an American lyric, right? But a, but a, but an international lyric um, with the inclusion, especially of um, of the the soccer players. Um, yeah, and, and I I I loved listening to you talk about those annotations on the right side of the page. That was incredibly instructive. Um, in, in that, um, that la that final image that you showed Marcus, I was, um, I'm sure some of this might've been situational when I was sort of rereading it, but, um, I was thinking about the, on page 145, which I, it appears just on the page right before the one you showed, um, the image of the hand around the neck. And you were talking about harm, bodily harm. Um, and here she talks quite a bit about injury and being injured. Who shouted? You, you shouted, you, you, the murmur in the air. This is page 145. You sometimes sounding like you, you sometimes saying you, go nowhere, be no one but you first. Nobody notices, only you've known. You're not sick, not crazy not angry, not sad. It's just this, 
you're injured. And I couldn't help but think, I had talked at the beginning about that Catholic school education, but there's something so sacrificial about this moment, not voluntarily sacrificial, right? But the, a connection to the sort of paschal lamb. And certainly we go back to that little girl image of the, of the sort of fawn um, with, you know, with that incredible face um, that is really, um, you know, it, it extremely sort of moving and I think underscores that long list of murders and then the images of the, the lynching and, and, and all of that. Um, but I saw that you wanted to, to move to the end of the, of the book, Marcus. Do you wanna bring back that page? And I think too, it's with, with so many interesting moving elements going on in the book, I think that, again, it was, it kind of had to happen for the book to end in a more narrative way or returning to the, to the mode of communication that uh, we've seen a lot of in the book. So this is the final piece of text, right? In the book, I can hear the even breathing that creates passages to dreams. So that's a perfect bridge between the lyric and the um, what's about to happen, which is the reiteration of um, narrative or like a, a narrative scene. Uh, and yes, I want to interrupt to tell him, her, us, you, me, I don't know how to end what doesn't have an ending. Tell me a story, he says, wrapping his arms around me. So now we're fully in the first person, right? Um, which speaks to progression and survival. Yesterday I began, I was waiting in the car for time to pass. A woman pulled in and started to park her car facing mine. Our eyes met and what passed, passed as quickly as the look away. She backed up and parked on the other side of the lot. I could have followed her to worry my question, but I had to go. I was expected on court. I grabbed my racket. Again, the circling back to all the Serena Williams content, all the sports content. Um, the sunrise is slow and cloudy, dragging the light in, but barely. Did you win? He asks. It wasn't a match, I say. It was a lesson. So in terms of tonally or like ending textually with fireworks when it comes to imagery, or song, it doesn't do that, right? Most of the, the fireworks and the song is right here at the top of this final page. But why it's ending like this is to then reiterate what I said about survival and resilience and in terms of like being engaged in a lifelong study to better humanity, <laughs> that's, that's what one of the things, the main things that the book is calling for. But just like in The Fire Next Time, Baldwin was calling for love and kind of giving a, at the end of the, the long uh, piece letter from a region in my mind, saying we can do this if we love each other and we trust that humanity is worth it. But I think the very final sentence in that is thinking back to the Old Testament and that how we will burn apart this world if we don't figure this out. And Rankin does that here with these final two images. And this is a painting from 1840, just called Slave Ship. And this is how, this is the full frame of the painting. And then this is the zoom in to an overboard slave being eaten by fish. And that is the final movement, piece of voice, piece of visual identity that we get. So violence is still out there, oppression is still out there. And essentially, do we have the patience and the resilience to figure out how to quell them is where the book goes. And I love the fact that, that she chooses to end um, with what's really out there and with the remaining threat. Because I was a little worried when I read the kind of, it's not, it wasn't a match, it was a lesson. The very first time I read it. Because <laughs> I was like, you have the ability to go 
full lyric, full image, do anything you want to do. You've done so much this whole book. So that was my could I take ask, on the ending. Yeah. Can I, I ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. I actually read the, it wasn't a match. It was a lesson as an indictment, it, especially th that being sort of followed by these in, this image. Um, so I, I'm curious just to sort of circle back for a second, how you, when you say you first read it and you were like, wait, what? Can you tell me how you were, you were reading that? Was it the flatness of it that you were responding yeah. to? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And okay. also too, it's so much is made in the book about the intensity that's added to racism and racial microaggressions when it comes to ascending the capitalistic ladder and learning when to either turn away or investigate and honing those instincts is is key to survival um yeah i got you thank you so we have a couple of comments here from susan that i'll just share with the group um she says, I'm glad that you are talking about the visuals. I did not see a lot of connection between most of the visuals in the text, except that many of the visuals were frightening. Um, and that she read the E version, so she didn't have the pairing of pages. Uh, it's clearly so meaningful here. Um, and she appreciates the discussion, so thank you. All right, Kathy, earlier you mentioned the subtitle, the American lyric part. Um, and I, I remember you mentioning during our rehearsal sort of that's a that's a meaningful part of this. And Claudia Ranking had earlier works that had the same subtitle. So I was wondering if you could share. Yeah, um, Don't Let Me Be Lonely, an American lyric is another American lyric. And I think now, Marcus, am I am I right in thinking that she's now used an American conversation twice? Yep. Okay. Um, so they they definitely seem to be, you know, intentional projects. Um I really did find this book to be uh, a lyric, um, but as I said a little while ago, maybe not just an American lyric, but certainly um, based in, as Marcus said a moment ago, so eloquently, sort of American, um, you know, white American sort of capitalist values and what Black Americans have had to um, sort of face. Um, as a result of those values. Um, so yeah, I, I find the, um, the recursive quality of the book as to especially speak to a lyric impulse, at least speaking as a poet, um, that was my experience of the book. Um, from the very beginning, um, we see uh, repetitions. That's what I mean by recursiveness, um, repeated images, repeated phrases at the very beginning, it's you smell good. Um, the mis constant misnaming by friends, um, the you is being called by the name of a maid instead of her own name or the name of another black friend instead of her own name. Um, I, I read a couple of, of um, moments about traveling and seats on planes and trains and subways, um, the phone issues, there's the phone issue with the therapist that Marcus talked about, but also the babysitter. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a moment when the neighbors call the police because the babysitter that the U has gotten is a black man who's standing outside on his phone. And so the neighbors call the cops on him. Um, and then, of course, the sports repetitions, the tennis and the soccer, and the way the tennis court, the actual physical space of where tennis is played becomes later the court of law, where, where justice, you know, justice is sort of meted out with various, the dates of various acquittals and inadequate uh, punishments for uh, you know, of, of sentencing in some cases, um, of murders of, of Black men, um, the repetition of what did you say? You know, did I hear that right? So, so that's, what I, that's what I meant by the word lyric being, I think, especially important here is that sort of recursive quality um, working against the progression of 
of the piece, which I think you know Marcus and I have both talked about as a kind of progressive project. And obviously progressive from book to book to book. Um, so yeah, that's, does that answer your question, that question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Adeliki here, or a comment, excuse me, more irony. The tennis player, Caroline Wozniacki, is Serena Williams' best friend on the women's tennis circuit. Uh, so we have just a few minutes left. Um, Marcus and Kathy, if you'd both like to share any closing thoughts before we wrap up. I was just so great. I just want to underscore what Susan said about um, Marcus's sort of discussion of the visual images I had asked. Um, Marcus, who is himself a visual artist, if he would sort of spend a little time sort of talking about that, he said, oh, absolutely, that's my plan. And I, I was really grateful. Um, I did, you know, I do have the book version, so I was able to sort of spend a lot of time with these images, thinking about them. I, I, I kept finding myself wanting, for example, the, you know, the, the, the soccer moment, um video to be like I wanted to be able to play you know I kept like doing this <laughs> you know, my fingers trying to get it to be harder <laughs> so I could see what was going on um but the, you know certainly because I'm not uh I don't watch tennis I don't watch soccer um I was sent to google many 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 times um looking up the names of folks and and figuring things out um and I was grateful for that. I mean, having to do a little, a little, you know, heavy lifting, um, you know, reading and rereading this book um, was really very informative and um, humbling. Um, just, I just want to thank uh, the author for making the book, but also to show me again that imagination and intellect, if you really, really push them can make new linguistic and visual space for multiple readers, multiple um, types of audience members to, to grow and to learn and to feel. A big thank you uh, to you, Marcus, and to you, Kathy. Uh, really appreciate all of your preparation and work for today. This is a, a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Clara. Thanks, Marcus. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you, Kathy.